Welcome to part three of chapter 15. This is where I'm going to introduce you to a topic that your textbook does not discuss, and that is the water cycle. I think the water cycle is extremely important to understand, and you, we do talk a little bit about how global circulation of water happens. So I'm gonna incorporate that, give you a little bit more details, and, um, and bring it down to some important implications uh, for living here on this planet. So the first thing I want you to know is uh, some terms you're probably already familiar with. For example, evaporation. Evaporation is simply going from liquid water to water vapor, the gaseous form, that's evaporation. And you get evaporation from, from the ocean as well as from the land. And what happens is that the water vapor goes up into the atmosphere. But what you might not know is that the vast, vast, vast majority of that water vapor precipitates in the form of rain or snow 90% of the time over the ocean. Now remember that the ocean does not make up 90% of the land or the, the mass of the earth. That's the, the surface level is really only closer to around 70%, but fully 90% of uh, precipitation happens over the oceans. That means that we've got only 10% of precipitation happening over land. Um, so, and this kind of makes a little bit of sense because there's a lot of moisture in the ocean and that, and that warm air rises and it falls, you know, blah, 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 stuff that we've already talked about. So um, let's focus here on what happens to that precipitation once it lands on the land. And um, in that you got a couple choices here. You can have a surface runoff, and surface runoff simply means that it runs like on a stream or a river along the surface of the land down to the ocean. Everything goes back to the ocean. On the other hand, you that some of that water can kind of percolate into the ground and become groundwater. But the thing about groundwater is that it never stays in the ground for a very long time. I mean, it might stay and that water might stay in the ground for 10,000 years, but eventually you're going to get groundwater runoff, which means that it's just percolating underground until eventually maybe it comes up in a spring and it'll run off and go back to the ocean. So that's what happens to most of that water, but some of that water and this is an interesting thing. Some of that water is going to be pulled up by the plants and it's going to evaporate from the plants. And here is your term. It is a new term for you. And this word is transpiration. Um, I have a little video to show you about uh, the effect of transpiration because I think it's really interesting and important. And it's probably a term you have not heard about before, but it's basically a form of evaporation from plants. And that transpiration evaporates up and the most of the time, the, the water that evaporates from the plant is going to actually land back on the land, just like most of the water over the open ocean is going to land back on the water. So let's take a look at my video. Maybe, maybe, I don't know why it's not working here. We'll do it this way. Go boldly, whoever you are. Whoever you are, go boldly. Here we go. A tropical rainforest without rain wouldn't be much of a rainforest. I mean, all plants need water to grow, and without it, they shrivel up and die. So what about the ancient Hawaiian proverb, hahai no ka uha i ka ulu la ao, which means the rain follows after the forest. How could that be? Well, all land plants lose water when the pores on their leaves open up during photosynthesis, and this evaporation draws more water up through their stems. With so much rain soaking the soil in rainforests, water is nearly unlimited, and accordingly rainforest trees can afford to move and lose more water than other plants. All that water vapor rising from the forest feeds moisture-laden clouds while also causing convection. Together, these effects accelerate the formation of rain, which falls to the soil and gets taken up all over again. This cycle of absorption, evaporation, and rain happens everywhere there are plants. However, super wet soil, fast pumping trees, and hot tropical sun make the cycle so fast in the rainforest that unlike other biomes where clouds might form in one place and rain in another, in a rainforest, all that water stays in the same region. 
Without the forest pumping so much water into the air, rainforests wouldn't be as rainy. And without so much rain, the forest couldn't pump so much water into the air. So which came first, the rain or the rainforest? Well, before rainforests, ancestors of trees like cypress, pine, and spruce dominated the land. But they were conservative when it came to using and losing water, so the air tended to be dry, meaning less rain. However, around 130 million years ago, a new kind of plant developed that took the risk of losing more water in return for souped-up photosynthesis. These were the flowering plants, and their risk paid off. Their faster growth enabled them to outcompete the ancestral pines and take over the tropical regions of the globe. These angiosperms lost so much water into the air that as they spread, they brought their own rain with them. And today, tropical rainforests receive more rain than if they were pine forests. In some places, as much as a meter more rain each year. That's equivalent to an extra two and a half hours of heavy rain each week. Not surprisingly, all that water cools off the forest, too, which is why the Amazon isn't nearly as hot as the Sahara or even an East Texas pine forest in summer. But the hot, dry tropics of the past may soon be a part of our future. In parts of the Amazon where vast swaths of rainforest have been logged or cleared for agriculture, unusual droughts are already occurring, and forest fires have become more frequent. Scientists worry that these changes will lead to ever hotter, drier, and more flammable tropics in the coming decades, making things tougher both for the remaining forest and for the people who live there. So when in drought, plant a tree. Seriously, hahai no ka ua i ka ulula ao. This ep- No, you don't need to, to know the Hawaiian term. But I think it's interesting that, that this whole idea of transpiration actually feeds as a really interesting loop onto itself. Uh, let's take a little bit closer look at the groundwater because groundwater is what gives the water to the plants that uh, then allows them to transpire and influence the weather. Uh, so so um, the groundwater is any location between the top of where that water level is going to be found and just for interest sake, you're, fr you're frequently going to find that at the level of a nearby stream. So however high that stream is, that's probably about the level of the groundwater uh, top. And then um, that groundwater is found in the place called an aquifer. An aquifer simply just means water holder. So the aquifer, the thickness of the, the aquifer is um, right here and aquifer holds the water. So however much groundwater you've got is however thick your aquifer is. Um, then you've got your bedrock and bedrock uh, is the bottom uh, underneath the aquifer and you, the water does not penetrate the bedrock. And then the water table is that level right there, at the top most level of your aquifer. Okay, so that's just your, like your basic anatomy of groundwater in an aquifer. So what I want you to know about, about this is that um, since we, we've just learned that only 10% of all precipitation on this earth falls on land, you can kind of divide that up. And of that, that small 10%, if we take that and we make a pie chart out of that, 40% of that water is coming from water evaporating from the oceans. And that means that 60% of all rain that falls on the land is actually coming to us from transpiration. As we cut down forests, we decrease, significantly decrease the amount of rain that we get. I know it's so weird, but that's exactly, exactly what's happening. Um, we can also look at um, some statistics about like where we get our water from. So if you think about all of the water on the planet, 97.5% of that Earth's water is salt water, which is literally you can't drink that. Um, so that means we got 2.5% of all the water on this planet is fresh water or drinkable. And one almost 2%, but 1.97% of that fresh water is frozen in the form of ice caps and glaciers. That's like almost 80% of all fresh water is frozen. As global warming continue, continues, that amount is decreasing, but where that water is going, it's actually ending up in the salt water or in the oceans. It's not ending up as other freely available water sources. And so this is a problem with global warming because it's causing the oceans to rise, but it's not providing us a heck of a lot more drinking water. 
So of the water that we can drink, about half of percent of all water, which is about 20% of fresh water, that's going to be found in the ground. So the only way to access that is through, um, is through wells. And I'll talk a little bit about wells in a second, but, but um, that's where, how we get our groundwater. About 0.03% of all fresh water is going to be found in lakes and rivers. I know around here we've got this beautiful Mississippi River, but that's a really small percentage of where fresh water comes from. On the other hand, that's where we around here tend to get our fresh water, unless you live on a farm or something along those lines. If you have city water, you're likely getting that water from the Mississippi River. And then a very, very, very small percent of fresh water is found in uh, the atmosphere. It is in the form of humidity. Um, there is some technology that's t able to take that humidity out of the water, out of, out of the air, and, and make drinkable water from it. But that's, um, that's very uh, rare to have that technology around. So kind of think about that when you're taking your next drink of water. So humans are using up a huge amount of groundwater. Um, remember, if I flip back one slide, about one half of a percent of all the the water on the earth is groundwater, but that's turns out of, of these readily available forms, that's the most abundant form. And that's where most of the people are getting their water from, is is the groundwater. Um, so we have we have used up, meaning we have depleted or lowered the water table uh, a significant amount. Um, and most of that water is being used for irrigating crops, which I, I suppose is a good thing. But it also turns out that over a billion people worldwide lack access to sanitary water, to clean, fresh water. And um, as we go through global warming, this number is only going to increase uh, because we are decreasing the amount of water readily available to us. And so it becomes this vicious cycle. Global warming is not just about the temperatures. It's about all kinds of things interacting. Um, and since most of you are not familiar with a well, let me just talk to you about what that well looks like. So here's our water table right here. And this is a pump a well that's pumping out water from the groundwater and it's um, doing a really good job of it and so what happens is it draws a lot of that water out and causes this cone of depression. Um, it's just the the water table isn't straight across it dips down because of this well that's pumping the water out. So any nearby wells that people are using for their house they are more likely to run dry if they're near a heavily pumped well. So the ground water dips down here and this is the kind of thing that you see in heavy irrigating uh, areas such as the desert southwest. And I do have a picture here. If you've never been to the desert southwest, this is what you might see out of a plane window. In fact, I took this picture out of a plane window as I was flying back from Arizona one day. So this is, this is a bunch of uh, fields in New Mexico and you'll notice that they are circular because in the middle of each of these fields is a well pumping water up from the ground and uh, and then they use that to in like the central arm and they just kind of circles around and you get these circular uh, shaped fields and of course this is the desert so these crops would not be growing if it weren't for these wells we have depleted the the um, the aquifers uh, throughout the United States. This this one in particular is called the Ogallala or the High Plains Aquifer, and it stretches from Nebraska all the way down through Texas. And what you see here is areas where there's high concentration of of agricultural fields where they require. Uh, they require irrigation and we have in certain areas of the Ogallala aquifer we have a drop of more than 40 feet um, in the water table and th that's really huge 
Um, it's really huge. There are some areas where it's being replenished, but the vast majority of the Ogallala Aquifer is decreasing. Um, and this is also played into by drought. Now this one's, uh, this is a drought monitor that I grabbed back in 2014. The drought is not nearly as bad this year as it was back in 2014, but um, the Ogallala Aquifer is right around here. And you can see that there was quite a bit of drought in 2014. And of course, I don't know if you remember, but the, in California, there was a huge drought. So with drought, you're not only not getting water, but you're not replenishing that groundwater. And this is a big problem. And because of global warming, we have some projections as to what's going to be happening into the future with drought. And this is a quite scary proposition because what they're projecting is that in the developed world and throughout some of the underdeveloped or developing world, we're going to have extensive drought. Any place where you see the, um, the pinks and purples and reds and oranges and yellows, those are areas of drought. And you can clearly see that in North America, we're going to have, a, they're projecting that we're going to have a huge drought. And it's just going to get worse. Also through Europe and, and much of Asia. There's some regions where they're projecting wetter areas, um, but that's not really around here. You know, you've got Northern Asia and, and Russia um, and into some Central Asia. You've got a little bit here in uh, Canada and, of course, in Alaska. But the vast majority of the Earth is looking like pretty dire situation. So hopefully you understand some of the implications of the water cycle. Hopefully that is being made clear for you. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get into chapter 16, some of those implications. But we're moving on now. And we do have to talk about communities. You know, talking about communities is much more fun than talking about ecosystems because ecosystems is basically just depressing. So let's have a little bit of fun as we wrap up chapter 15, talking about communities. And I've already defined communities for you. Remember that communities is um, a way of living things that they interact with each other. And there's four basic ways that they interact through competition, predation or parasitism, commensalism and mutualism. And, and I'll go through all four of those with you as as we finish up this chapter, but I've got a couple more terms to talk to you about. Um, the first one is co-evolution. Co-evolution, I know we already talked about evolution, but co-evolution happens when two organisms are forcing each other to evolve just because they're interacting with each other. And that fits under the category of community ecology. So the example that I'm gonna step you through is the one from your book, and that is this moth, which is from Madagascar, and it has a proboscis or tongue that is about 11 inches long. And that kind of seems kind of absurd how long this tongue is. There's, there's no other uh, moth or, or butterfly in nature that, that has quite such a long proboscis. And um, this moth feeds exclusively on this orchid. And this orchid has an extremely long tube that that goes all the way down, and it's cut off here, so it goes all the way down, and at the very bottom of that tube is a little bit of nectar. So this is called the nectar tube. And this moth comes in and it, um, and it unfurls its tongue and it sticks it down this tube just to get a little sip of sugar water, or nectar. And, um, and these two have kind of like this relationship where this is the pollinator of this, this flower. Without this pollinator, this flower could not reproduce. So it, the flower is really dependent upon the moth. And the only way the moth gets close enough to the pollen, which is located right here, is if it can entice that moth to get really, really, really close. And so it has this really, really long nectar tube. But here's where the coevolution happens because the moth 
it, it gets this it gets this pollen all over it and it, then it goes to the next orchid and and pollinates that one um, but of course it's not an ideal situation for the moth I mean having less pollen on it means it can fly better so it's better it's in the moth's best interest to not get pollen on it um, it's in the flower's best interest to give as much pollen as it can onto that onto that moth but not give up too much sugar water so if the orchid evolves a little bit longer nectar tube then then the moth doesn't get food and the flower gets pollinated really well on the other hand if the moth gets a little bit longer tongue then it gets the nectar really easily and doesn't have the pollen so what happens is this idea of co-evolution the two organisms are forcing each other to evolve longer and longer and longer proboscis or tongue and, and nectar tube um, so that's what co-evolution is and that kind of thing happens anytime that you have two organisms interacting with each other really closely you get this co-evolution thing the other important term for what we're going to be talking about with community ecology is the concept of the niche that's what this word is right here niche or you might pronounce it niche um, I, I like niche but that's just that's just me you can pronounce it however you like so a niche is the way that an organism lives in its environment and it's you can think about it the niche is the job in a way of that organism but that's not quite accurate so I'm just gonna step through these these uh, these characteristics of how you can think about a niche and hopefully this will clarify the concept so a niche is the space that an organism requires to live uh, here's a map of where bald eagles are located throughout North America so the the summer grounds the the winter grounds and there's some where you can find bald eagles all year round remember where we live you're only finding bald eagles uh, in the winter time they they head back up to their summer grounds and again that's part of the niche like how they're living their lives if that makes sense you also think about the type and amount of food that the organism utilizes and for the bald eagle they eat um, they eat fish you can kind of see this bald eagle is kind of carrying a little fish around in its claws and um, they also eat carrion so they are detritivores if you remember what that term detritivore means it means that they eat dead things so it's not uncommon to see a bald eagle on the side of the road or whatever picking up a, a bit of dead deer or what have you um, another part of the niche is the timing of an organism's reproduction this is extremely important because as the population increases with reproduction it's going to be utilizing other resources and so um, that's kind of an important characteristic of the niche and finally we'll talk about an organism's temperature and moisture requirements and any necessary living condition for that and like bald eagles they like older trees with nice branches in them so they can build their nests right any anything that is required for these organisms to live that's what a niche is okay now that we understand coevolution and niche we can start to talk about those four types of interactions that organisms have and the first type of, of interaction on the list is competition and competition is an extremely important form of interaction and this always happens when niches overlap if two organisms have very very similar requirements for how they live and they live in the same place you're going to get competition they're going to be competing for food they're going to be competing for other resources like space and 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 who's reproducing when and all of these other things so if you've got competition there's really only two possible outcomes of that competition I mean of all the times this has been researched researchers have found basically two outcomes the first outcome is called competitive exclusion and competitive exclusion means that one species out competes the other species for a resource 
And you'd think, you know, go purple bacteria, go, you know, go paramecium, purple paramecium, poor green paramecium. Um, but here's the thing about competition is that it doesn't matter that the purple paramecium won the competition and the other ones were competed away, ex competitive exclusion, they're, they're dead and gone. The purple bacteria are actually harmed by this competition. Now, I like as much a good competition as next as much as the next person, but um, but it's it can be hard on them. And one of the reasons that the the purple paramecium are harmed is because at some point the green paramecium have used up some of those resources and some of that energy is used in this competition process and so it seems all sunshine and roses for the purple ones but um, they are harmed by this process as well. All competition is harmful to both species involved. It's just with competitive exclusion this one is harmed more. Another possible outcome is called resource partitioning. And with resource partitioning, it is exactly what it sounds like. Like the resources in this test tube, for example, are split up. And this sounds like very, very happy. Like, oh, green paramecium, you can have the top and us purple paramecium, we'll take the bottom bunk and it'll all be good. But that's not how it works. With resource partitioning, what's happening is that they're competing for resources. But in the bottom half of this test tube, the purple ones are winning the competition. And in the top half of it, the green ones are winning the competition. That's all this means. They're not like having some mutual detente agreement that says, hey, you take this and I'll take this and we'll be good. It doesn't work that way. They are literally competing. Um, and it looks in the end like they've partitioned it. Uh, but they've just really competitively excluded each other from the various regions. So hopefully that makes sense. Competition is a is a lose lose situation for for anybody involved in it. The next concept is predation, and we'll spend a little bit of time on predation. Um, and so basically, um, with predation, you definitely have one winner and you definitely have one loser. And of course, predation is where one organism is eating or consuming in some way another organism. Predation frequently ends up in co-evolution. So, um, and these, this co-evolution happens and what you, what you end up getting are, are a lot of defenses against predators, which of course then the predators evolve defenses to overcome the defenses of the prey and uh, you get co-evolution. But your book talks about two basic categories of defenses, physical defenses and behavioral defenses. And we are going to go through those as well, starting with going through a few physical defenses, starting out here with mechanical defenses. So a mechanical defense is anything that like is, is physically a defense. You got your quills of your porcupine, which are very, very similar to the spines of a cactus. Those are very physical. Or here's this armadillo, and an armadillo can curl up into a ball, and that is actually a mechanical defense because now the predator is just going to bat this thing around and it's not going to be able to eat the armadillo. So mechanical defense. The defense number two are chemical defenses. And with chemical defenses, this is any toxin or a poison that makes the organism unpalatable. And uh, so I've got a picture of, of um, this is poison ivy. These are three, let it be. And um, this is a poison arrow frog. So, um, so hunters in South America will, will run their arrows or their, their darts along this frog's skin and it will, they'll pick up the toxins and then they'll use that to shoot down their prey. Or you can see this toadstool here has toxins as well. Um, almost all plants produce some kind of chemical to deter organisms that eat it. Um, that's some for some plants the only way that it can it can do that. So that's a chemical defense. The next one is uh, here we're talking about um, about mimicry, and mimicry is where one organism evolves to look like another organism. 
Um, usually, it turns out to be, they, they evolve to look like an organism that has a kind of a chemical defense or something along those lines. So we, what we have here are two butterflies. They are not related. Well, they're, I mean, they're butterflies, so they're sort of related, but they're not closely related. Um, this is a viceroy butterfly, and this is a monarch butterfly. Look very, very similar, um, but, but not that closely related. The monarch butterfly has a chemical defense. The viceroy butterfly does not have nearly as an effective chemical defense. And so um, anywhere where you find monarchs, if there's an overlap of territory, you see this viceroy looking very, very similar. So the viceroy has evolved to look like the monarch. If you think about if you're a bird and you go and you try to eat a monarch butterfly, and it tastes terrible and bitter, and you spit it out, and you might even end, end up vomiting because it's so bad. Um, and if you happen to see a viceroy next, you are not going to be eating that viceroy because you'll have this bad memory of, of eating the monarch. So that's what mimicry is. Here we see a couple of different kinds of snakes. One is a coral snake, and one is a king snake. One of them is poisonous, venomous actually, and one of them is not. And uh, I don't know if you know the difference, but there's this rhyme that helps, it helps you remember it, and that's red on black friend jack. So this one has red right next to the black stripe, so this is a friendly snake. This is a king snake. And then red on yellow kills a fellow. So red next to yellow, no bueno, don't, don't go near it, it could kill you. But the king snake has evolved to look very similar to the coral snake as a defense, even though the king snake is not, in fact, um, venomous. Our next one is, um, oh, and by the way, sorry, going back here, we're talking about warning coloration. So bright patterns like the red and black and yellow and this orange and black, that's warning colorations. Um, so the next one is camouflage, and I mean clearly makes sense. If you can blend in, you're not going to be seen, so you're not going to be eaten. And you take a look here at some examples of camouflage. You got your camouflage cicada. You got your camouflage. Uh, what is this? Um, stick insect, I I think. Um, and that oh, actually it's a praying praying mantis. And then we've got um little jaguar over here blending into the dry grasses so camouflage all right so those are our four physical defenses we've got a couple behavioral defenses as well including hiding or escaping and there's a couple of ways that hiding or escaping can happen to avoid predation um, i really like this uh, I got rid of the video. Sorry, I'm not going to show you the video, but I really like this idea of schooling because if you're a fish in an open ocean, you, you can't hide anywhere. So you use your um, members of the same species bodies to help hide the individual that you are. That's what a schooling behavior does. Uh, and then you can also do alarm calling and fighting back. So if you've ever seen Meerkat Manor, you might have seen, I guess it's an old TV show now, you might not have seen it, but they could do these alarm calls and if they happen to see a predator around, they warn the whole family. Um, there's also this idea of mobbing where smaller animals will attack a larger animal in groups to discourage them from eating them. So it's called mobbing. And then I really love this example here of, of fighting back. This is a, is a bird that literally it's called a fulmer bird and it will literally as a baby it will vomit on any predator that comes near it so fighting back that's kind of wild of course but we've got coevolution right so with coevolution we have to take into consideration that it's not just the prey that are evolving it's also the predators so um, predators have evolved things like toxin avoidance remember some plants have a lot of toxins in them. Well, there are some animals that can perfectly well eat those toxic foods. And so we say that they have co-evolved toxin avoidance. 
Um, we also know that a lot of predators have really good sensory perception, so predators are going to have better eyesight and vision that helps them detect prey, and predators are faster in general than the prey that they eat. So coevolution here, got this this um, cheetah and it has co-evolved to be this the fastest living thing the second fastest is its prey the gazelle I just have a few more slides to get through with you so I'm gonna push through and talk about how predators have um, have adaptations and one of them is mimicry we talked about mimicry for prey organisms to avoid predation but predators have evolved mimicry to, to entice their prey. And this is an anglerfish. And this right here is a lure that the anglerfish uses to, yes, this is very similar to what you'd find in Finding Nemo. I know you recognize it. Um, it's a lure and it uses this to like wiggle in, out in the world. And um, it's actually physically part of its body. And so it mimics a, a little uh, a sea creature that looks like a potential food item. And when the, the thing that's coming thinks it's going to eat this, it actually gets eaten by, by the angler fish or the frog fish. Um, so we've, when we think about predation, we usually think about something eating an, an organism whole. But we could also think about parasitism as a form of predation. Parasites are predators that that kind of live with or on their hosts. Instead of completely killing it all at once, it might it might take a really, really, really long time to eat it, or it might just live inside or on that host for, for a, a long time. You can have ectoparasites. Those are parasites that live on the outside of their host. Then you can have endoparasites. Those are parasites that live inside their hosts. Um, we're almost done with our interactions. We only have two more. The next one is a mutualism. And mutualism happens when, when both species are benefiting from the interaction. Like, like what happens with bees and flowers. Both bees and flowers benefit from that interaction. We call that a mutualism. That example earlier of the moth and the orchid, that was also a mutualism. Both are benefiting from this interaction. Uh, you can also have commensalisms, and commensalism happens when one species benefits, but the other species is like, meh, whatever, it's all good. Um, they're neither benefiting nor are they harmed. So what you see here is a cattle egret, and cattle egrets benefit by living on these uh, buffalo or elephants or something along those lines in, in Africa. And um, what happens is that these grazers go along and they're just, you know, doing their thing. They don't care that there's birds on them, whatever. But as they're moving along, they kick up all these insects. And the insects are food for the cattle egret. And so the cattle egret benefits by hanging out with the water buffalo or the elephant or what have any other large grazing mammal in the African savanna and the, the grazer is really not har harmed at all by this interaction. So that's commensalism. Last slide here for you. Just wanting to talk a little bit about the concept of the keystone species. And a keystone species is a, a species that is so important to a community that if that species were removed, the community would no longer exist. So this was first discovered by a researcher back way back in the 1920s. This is almost 100 years ago. And what happened is that this guy is like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I removed all the sea stars from this little bit of ocean. And so that's what he did. He removed all the sea stars. And very quickly, what happened is that the community disappeared. Remember that a community is an interaction of, of different species. What happened is that only the mussels remained. And so all of these other organisms disappeared. What was going on is that the, the sea stars eat the mussels. And so when the predator is gone, this prey was so good at outcompeting all the other species that just completely took over the, the area. 
and outcompeted all of the other organisms. Basically, the community completely collapsed. So a keystone species is a species that is actually the, has a huge amount of influence on how many other species are around. When the sea star is present, there's lots and lots and lots of different species. And when the sea star is absent, there's only one species. All right, well, I hope you have enjoyed chapter 15, and I will see you in class.